Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our service this morning that's being led by Mrs. Judith Norris, uh, one of our own members from Christchurch Woodley. But before I hand over to Judith, we thought it appropriate before we begin the service that we have a minute's silence to remember His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and perhaps during this time, some of our our thoughts can go to our beloved Queen Elizabeth and the wider family. And so we'll just take a moment now um, in silence before we begin our worship.
And now I hand over to Judith Norris. Judith, we look forward to sharing in this time of worship with you. Ruth, thank you for your worship, uh, your welcome. And I'd like to add my welcome to this time of worship, whoever you are and wherever you may be. We're devoting this time to the worship of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And so we begin with a call to worship from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Last Sunday, we celebrated the risen Jesus as we remembered that his closest friends found his tomb empty. Today, we remind ourselves that Jesus is very much alive in our world today. And so we sing our first hymn in Singing of Faith, it's number 297. Christ is alive, let Christians sing. come to a time of prayer together. Let us pray. O oh God, our God, we come before you now to offer you our praise and our worship. You watch over us in times of uncertainty. You lead us into new experiences of your love and care. You challenge us to face new situations with you. And when the experiences of life bring us sorrow or pain, you are there to give us comfort and peace. You know each one of us better than we know ourselves, yet you go on loving us. Most of all, in sending Jesus, your son, into the world, you have shown us the extent of your love for us. In Jesus, you took human form with all its limitations, so that you could show us your truth. In Jesus, you showed us how to live. 
in Jesus your selfless love overcame even death. In Jesus you reached out to give us your life and so we worship you. We praise you for the gift of your Holy Spirit in our lives, showing us where we have gone wrong, working in us to cleanse and to heal, giving us strength to live your way and guiding us in our journey of life with you. Oh God, you are our God and we are your people. We offer you the words and music of this time together in praise to you. When we return to our day-to-day -day activities, help us to go on worshipping you by the way we live our lives. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Amen. And now we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now in a short while, our junior church will be meeting. But before they do, a few words which I hope they'll be able to um, follow. And perhaps families with children could unmute because I have an easy question for you to begin with. I hope you've been able to get out for walks recently. I wonder. What do you notice as you walk or travel around where you live that is perhaps different from a month or six weeks ago? Have you noticed any changes, particularly if you've been able to go to parks or walk alongside gardens? I'll give you a clue. Okay. Flowers have been growing. Flowers have been growing, haven't they? Yeah. Um, have you noticed any change in the trees? I'm having trouble. <laughs> what have you noticed about trees? Right. Well, get they've been getting getting new leaves, haven't they? And wonderful blossoms on many of the trees around. It's so sad that we had that frost, and some of the blossoms are looking um, not the pretty colour they started with. But however, still. Lots of signs of new life around at the moment. I want to show you a couple of plants from my garden. Um, last year we made some changes in the garden, so I had to dig up some plants and I potted them up. And I hope you can see that I've got this plant. I'm not used to this. Uh, what do you think of that? Would you like it in your garden? Perhaps not. Um, there's a lot of dead stuff on it at the moment. Twigs, leaves. It's been sitting outside my greenhouse all through the winter. But there is actually a new life in it. And I've got another one that's uh, far the of the green shoots on it. And that had died down completely in the winter. 
but now it's coming back to life. Yes. Yeah. I, I looked at a bare patch of earth in my garden the other day and I thought, oh, has my hosta died or will I see it again? And then just a few days ago, I saw all these new shoots coming up through the ground. So my hosta is very much alive and will be producing some really big leaves later in the year. And I think the perennial gardeners among you will be looking at your gardens and finding lots of surprises there. Well, today we're remembering um, and celebrating that Jesus who died and whose body was laid in a tomb was raised to life and met his disciples in a number of different places. Now, I'm going to hand over to James, who's going to give you um, the junior church theme, say a prayer, and then introduce um, their hymn. Thank you, James. Today in Zoom Junior Church, we will be hearing the story of how Jesus walked and talked to his followers on the road to Emmaus and how they did not recognise him until he broke bread with them that evening. Let us pray. Dear God, often we do not see you in the everyday things we do as we are so tied up in all our regular activities. Help us to take time each day to look for you in the people we meet and in, ev in our everyday lives. Amen. We will now sing This Is The Day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Now, as the junior church go to their own virtual space, we ask God's blessing upon them and their leaders and also on us as we remain in the main service. Amen. Now it's time for us to have our Bible readings. So I'm asking James Taylor and Janu Nightingale. Thank you for bringing our readings to us. Uh, the first reading is from John chapter 20, verse 19 to 31. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening 
of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus appears to Thomas. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelfth, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The purpose of John's gospel. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. The second reading is Act 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple's court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Thank you, James and Renu, for bringing us those readings. Now we sing again. Very beautiful Easter hymn. Now the green blade rises from the buried grain. 306 in singing the faith. <laughs>
like rain that sleeps unseen. Love is come again, love in queens that swims up green. Forth he came at Easter, like the risen rain. He had fallen for three days in the grave and lay. Quick from the dead, my risen Lord is seen. Love is come again, like wheat that springs up green. Some years ago, I was in a Sunday service at Christchurch when the minister asked all the men who had the colour red in their ties to come to the front. And when they did so, they were asked to line up facing the congregation. The minister looked along the row, walked up and down and said about one man, well, he's always rude to me, and then took out a pair of scissors and cut a huge chunk off his tie. Can you believe it? A minister did that in front of the whole church. You might find that story hard to swallow, but I know it happened because I was there. What is it about a witness statement that makes it, un makes it believable? How do you judge whether someone is telling the truth? I think you consider a number of things such as can you trust the witness? Is what you have been told likely to have happened? Does it fit in with your experience and knowledge of the circumstances? Is anyone else telling the same story? Is there any other evidence to back up what you've been told? However, after all these considerations, there's always a personal element. We try to be fair and objective, but we all see things in our own way. These ideas of evidence, belief and disbelief, trust and mistrust are very much in our news when the COVID pandemic is being discussed, and particularly when vaccinations are the main topic for discussion. To many minds, scientific knowledge is no match for ancient prejudices or cultural tradition. Consequently, during the past week, well-known and trusted people such as Seleni Henry have gone public to encourage people to believe the scientists and the doctors and get ourselves vaccinated. Things that are normal practice to some people are unthinkable to others. Have you ever been faced with disbelief over something you've said? You know that what you've just said is true, but it comes as such a surprise to your listener that it's greeted with words such as, you don't say, no, that can't be true. In our reading from John's Gospel, it was like this with the disciples when they told Thomas that they had seen the risen Jesus. I don't believe you was his reaction. I must see it for myself. He could not accept what they were saying. Why was that? Should Thomas have believed them? After all, they were his friends. They had been together for some time and had been through a lot together. Surely they knew whether or not they could take each other seriously, trust each other. We're not talking about one or two disciples here, but a fairly large group who had all the same story to tell. Still, Thomas rejected their testimony, their witness account. He could not believe that Jesus was alive 
without seeing the Lord himself. Indeed, he wanted to see Jesus' wounds, to be sure that it was him. I think that many of us are aware that to refer to Thomas as doubting Thomas does him rather an injustice. After all, other early witnesses to the resurrection doubted that Jesus could be alive and only believed when they saw the risen Jesus. Think about Mary in the garden or the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. They were uncertain until they recognised the risen Jesus. We've no idea why Thomas wasn't in that room with the other disciples on that first Easter Sunday. But when they met again a week later, it seems that Jesus appeared particularly for Thomas's benefit. Jesus knew what questions Thomas had in his mind and he was dealing with them. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus knew how important it was that his closest followers should be convinced that he was alive. Thomas didn't need to touch Jesus. What he saw was enough to convince him and he responded with a profound declaration of faith. My Lord and my God. Like the other disciples, he had seen for himself the risen Jesus. A witness is someone who sees at first hand. The first disciples believe that Jesus is the Son of God because they experienced at first hand his resurrection. But Jesus himself told them that for others, faith in him would not be a matter of seeing him in the flesh, but of believing without seeing. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed for those who would believe because of the disciples' message. He said, I ask not only on behalf of these, meaning his disciples, but on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. In praying this way, he was showing how important the witness statements of the disciples would be for future generations. The future mission of the church was entrusted to them. However, they were given the help of the Holy Spirit in this tremendous task. As Peter said, And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given us, has given to those who obey him. Later in his ministry, Peter wrote to some Christians to encourage them as they were facing persecution. And it's clear from some of his words that these Christians had never actually seen Jesus. This means that they came to faith because of what others told them. Peter wrote, you love him although you have not seen him and you believe in him although you do not now see him. So you rejoice with a great and glorious joy which words cannot express because you are receiving the salvation of your souls which is the purpose of your faith in him. So the witness of the first disciples was to enable others to have faith in Jesus as the son of God and giver of life. Another way of thinking of this is that Jesus should be acknowledged as Lord and Saviour. Thomas's immediate response on recognising the risen Jesus was to say, my Lord and my God. One commentator I read, D.A. Carson said, the most unyielding sceptic has bequeathed us the most profound confession. This confession of faith was in the Jesus who bore the marks of the cross. Paul says of Jesus in Romans chapter 1, he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Christian faith rests on the conviction 
that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The alternatives we face are either faith in a saviour who was crucified but then resurrected, or unbelief. Our second reading, which was from Acts, gives us a glimpse into the life of the first Christians in Jerusalem. They met regularly to learn more about Jesus from those who had been with him throughout his earthly ministry. They shared in communion in their homes. I want to commend all those who've kept our services going during the past year, either on Zoom or through the printed sheets. It's been a huge task for some people week after week. The first Christians also shared their possessions and even sold goods and property so that there was mon money to provide for those who had little or nothing. We need to remember that they expected Jesus to return soon in their lifetime and they didn't expect to put down roots anywhere. What I want us to take from this is the care they took of each other in practical ways. I think we see many of examples of this through items on the news and through the efforts of those in Christchurch who've been involved in the drop-off tables by our lower hall entrance at the church building. In the most difficult of times, they have found ways to help others. Tomorrow is another stage in getting back to what we used to regard as normal living. Some things will bring relief, like getting a haircut. Others will make us quite anxious. Let's keep to our habits of prayer, Bible study and fellowship with others, however difficult that may be at times, and do our, whatever we can, however little, to help others in need. So where does all this leave us today? I think we must take on trust the eyewitness accounts of the earliest disciples as we find them in the New Testament. They were written down and preserved so that we and countless others in the last around 2,000 years could, in the words of John chapter 20, verse 31, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. We have to put our faith in Jesus himself as the one who offers us forgiveness and life. This is more than an intellectual assent of what someone said. It's a personal commitment to the Son of God such that he becomes our whole reason for being. In the words of Henry Alford's hymn, we walk by faith and not by sight. No gracious words we hear of him who spoke as none e'er spoke, but we believe him near. We may not touch his hands and side, nor follow where he trod, yet in his promise, we rejoice and cry, my Lord and God. Amen. The hymn I've chosen to sing next is a fairly modern one and, and um, emphasises practical aspects of being a Christian in the world today. 660 and singing of faith, called by Christ to be disciples.
We turn now to our prayers of intercession. And there's a response I'd like you to make. The word, Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. Also, um, a little later in the prayers, there will be an opportunity for you to unmute and add your, your own prayers um, of particular concerns that you may have. So, let us pray. Lord, we pray for your world. When you made it, it was good, beautiful and perfect. We are sorry for the ways in which we, we spoil your world by the things we do and the choices we make. We thank you for those who remind us that we cannot go on using and misusing the Earth's resources. Help us to be willing to change the way we live so that the Earth will be sustained for future generations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those for whom daily living is a struggle those in the poorest countries who must work long hours for little reward and barely have enough to feed their families. Those in our own country who have no work because of COVID-19 and don't know how they'll pay the bills and feed their families. Open our eyes to help in any way we can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for young people everywhere, for those who are at school, college or university, or on apprenticeship training. We pray for those facing the restrictions which COVID-19 has brought to places of education and training that they will be able to cope with the new challenges and settle into different ways of learning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are lonely, those who are alone, those who feel they've been for forgotten, those who feel sad and uncertain. Those who are ill. And those who care for them. The doctors and nurses, porters and cleaners, working in our hospitals and medical centres. And now, Lord, we pray for those who grieve the loss of a loved one. We pray that our Queen Elizabeth, her family and those close to them may know your peace in their sorrow at the death of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. We give thanks for his extraordinary life and all that he did for others particularly young people through the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme and for his work for conservation. We pray also for the family of Richard Corrigea that they may know your peace in their tragic loss. Now I invite you to unmute if you wish to pray for particular people you know in any kind of need. I'd like to, I'd like to pray for Faye Morris who has a cataract operation tomorrow. We pray for my neighbour Anne, who was taken into hospital yesterday. 
Uh, could we please pray for Karen and Alistair Todd? Karen is our lovely coordinator for the Volunteer Centre, and Alistair has take it, taken over from his chairman. Their lovely mother, Grace, died a few days ago, aged 98. Um, she and her lovely husband, Bernard, had been married for about 75 years. So please pray for the whole family, please, uh, in, their, in their sadness. with people who are suffering from mental health issues um, due to loss of work or uh, any other reason uh, because of COVID or, um, be especially close to them and wrap them in your loving arms. Lord, we bring to you those who have just been named in their need. You know them. We pray that they will know that you are there for them. Now, we pray that we may all take our share in showing the love of God to those he sends us each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. In the name of Jesus, whose healing touch reached out to those in need. Amen. <clears throat> our final hymn is one of confidence in, and assurance. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Thank you. No. 
And now, our, our final blessing. God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, give you grace, mercy and peace. May they be yours in truth and love. Amen.